All right. Well, thanks for coming to everyone today. Uh, we have Mike Dawson from the St. Louis Zoo, uh, and he is actually going to be talking about his uh, spring peeper program for the entire St. Louis area, but I got some really cool news. Uh, Mike's also going to be using the Litzinger site as a part of his upcoming research for the spring peeper program. Uh, so with that, I will let Mike uh, tell you a little bit about himself and uh, what he's going to be doing here and move on with the presentation. Okay, thank you, James. So today I'm, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the a newer project at the zoo. It's one of our wild care projects called the Spring Peeper Program. And I'll give you a little information to start with about myself um, and then how the project got started and, and what the goals and objectives and what are the what species we're kind of looking for. So let me, whoop, there we go. So who I am, if, if you've happened to hear my name or run across me or have seen me or have met you, uh, my name is Mike Dawson. I, um, my title at the zoo is Conservation Education Liaison, um, and it doesn't really tell you exactly what I do for the zoo, but I have a, a unique job where I work for the education department, um, but I work in a lot of different citizen science related uh, field projects, um, and I also work with the herp herpetology department and insectarium department as their, as, as their liaison for education and help create materials and create videos and all kinds of different content. Um, and one of my other duties is assigned is I'm also the frog wash chapter coordinator. So I run, it's a, a nationwide project that looks at frog and toads uh, populations in our area. Um, they're looking for the phenology and the timing when they come out and people go through a training, register sites. And so some of the data I've collected over the years, either personally or data that's collected through these projects, I started going through it because nobody was using some of that data and it gets and in essence uploaded to a national database, but locally it was not being used. And so I started kind of look at it and uh, I wanted to see if there was something about the data that might be useful here. And that's where some of this project kind of grew out of. So one of the uh, things that I typically do, I'm always working with uh, youth, adults. Um, I love frogs and toads. Uh, the nickname that some of the youth groups I've worked with call me Frogman. Um, usually because I'm in waiters looking for frogs um, and, and, and same with my own children. They get tired of actually listening for frogs um, or looking for frogs. And this is what I, I do in my spare time, even when I'm not working for the zoo or, or in other places. Um, and, and so I started looking around and what I was looking for, I couldn't find within the city area. And I'll go into it. This is the, <clears throat> the breeding call that I've been looking for. And it, it's been hard to find. So what this noise is, hopefully you can hear it. This is uh, the breeding call of, of a lot of, of chorus of peepers calling that typically is normal as you go into this, this month um, all over the area, but typically we're not finding it anymore. And so one of the things I started to look at was the watersheds of our area. And so you should be able to recognize this is 270 and all the different watersheds that make up um, our city area, at least a core. Um, and there's a lot of things that happen if you look at the history, and I did not grow up here, so it's been actually neat for me to read about the history of the city. Um, I'm a Florida boy, is where I grew up in Orlando, Florida, walk around the swamps and areas. So when I came here, it was neat for me to learn about what had happened to the waterways of the area, especially as urbanization went farther out from the core. Um, and so over time, uh, one of the things that you'll notice, and especially as you go close to the city, um, you're going to notice that a lot of our rivers and creeks and things like that have been channelized um, for uh, flood control and other reasons. And, and if you go historically, if you grew up here, you're probably familiar with uh, this is River De Pere. Um, the, a lot of times you get garbage in, in these rivers and traditionally it was a sewer. Um, unfortunately, if you start back in the 1800s. A lot of these areas were used um, to dump actual just sewage into it, um, which degraded some of those areas. And, and, so, and that's why if you go to the real hardcore downtown, there really isn't any more creeks and rivers and there used to be, um, but they don't exist anymore. And I, I lived in Florissant now for, I just moved to Fenton, but I was in Florissant for about two, just under 20 years. Um, and one of the things that I noticed up there, which was interesting is that Coldwater Creek, which has also been, looks just like this in many parts of it. Um, and there's also different kinds of pollution in North County. Um, one of them is radiation um, from different types of leftover parts from the atomic uh, program. So there's, there's all kinds of issues in, in the city area that have met massive decline of a lot of our pop frogs and toad populations. And what's kind of fascinating is some of them are coming back. So it's not all negative, uh, but this was something I, I noticed by looking around all of our different waterways. Um, 
and this is just a good example. And so a lot of times we even have some of these places where we're bringing back green spaces along these areas, but they're not really conducive for frog travel. Um, usually they're grass or there's no open water areas. And so some of the other things that have also changed um, is a lot of the places that frogs could live and, and some do. Um, there is a lot of bullfrogs and green frogs and other frogs in the city area. Uh, but typically they're in areas that are for fishing now. A lot of them have become fishing spots for recreation. This is me actually, I think when, I don't know how long ago this was, fishing at one of our local parks. Um, and this is even a retention pond near uh, where I live where the retention pond itself has become a, a stocked area. And so this definitely changes some of the ecology for some of our small frogs. And we'll get into it why this is, and, and I go out and survey even just around my neighborhood and you've seen all kinds of neat frogs, just not certain ones, and I'll kind of get into it. Um, and so the other reason is some of this urban runoff, I mean, retention ponds are needed for construction, but they do funnel a lot of pollution from, man, especially man-made pollution um, into our watershed. So even if they are areas where it could be suitable habitat, um, some of these areas end up with literally like physical trash, but also all kinds of chemical runoff that can affect different frog species. Now, there are some that don't seem to be as bothered by it, uh, but it does accumulate large amounts in some of these areas. Bullfrogs that I've seen and green frogs seem to be able to tolerate some of these different areas that are somewhat polluted. So what I noticed is by looking at, and this is just kind of give you a snapshot, there's lots of other data sets, but I pulled all the data sets. Um, if you're familiar with iNaturalist and FrogWatch uses a program called FieldScope. Um, these are all the observations of frog and toad up that I could find all the different species. In our area, there's about 10 common species. And so if you were to look at our area, you can barely see it right in here, but there's Interstate 270 right there. And, I, and this is just what I pulled around the, the city area. Um, and so this is community science data, and it does show there's a lot of frog observations, even right into the city. But what happens is when you start looking at individual groups or species, you start to see a different pattern. And so when I started to look at some of the data sets, what I found was this. When you look at spring peepers, cricket frogs, and chorus frog observations, they seem to be pretty spotty, um, even some places outside, but definitely on the inside of that 270 belt. And I, I wondered why, because if you go back, you can see there's a lot of frog observations, just not these species. And one of the things they, they share in common is they're all in the same family. So they, they belong to the, fam the Hylidae family. So they're related to tree frogs. Now, if I were to put tree frog data back in here, there would be a lot of tree frogs. There's no problem with tree frogs inside this 270 belt. But these um, animals are a little bit different. They breed a little bit earlier than tree frogs. And obviously they spend a little more time in the water because they're up and down the trees. Um, these guys are the, if you want to call it the less climbing ones. So they do have toe pads, just not as good as a tree frog. So they spend a little more time around the bottom and in and out of water. And they also typically are looking for something a little bit different than other frog species, which is they typically breed in ephemeral ponds. And so areas that have fishless ponds that sometimes dry up, which is why fish usually can't survive in those things. And a lot of those areas have also disappeared is what I've noticed. So what I wanted to do is when I noticed this, I, I, I had an idea and somebody at the zoo thought it was a great idea and they helped me create a, a project out of this, which is to identify and protect any remaining populations of the spring peepers, uh, Western chorus frogs and cricket frogs in our area. Now, none of these frogs are endangered. Obviously, if you go out in the state, you can find all of these. But I did find that a lot of cities have the exact same problem, not always with the same species, but with a particular group of species inside the city area around the city declines faster than other ones. And so I wanted to find out, number one, um, or excuse me, number two, the study the urbanization, try to figure out the causes and if we can do something about it. Um, is it a way that as urbanization goes out or things we could do to, to make a difference? Is there particular toxins that are causing just these species and not other ones? Or is it just habitat decline? Is it just not exist anymore? So my goal this year, um, and I'll get to it in a second, um, is I do want to try to bring back these diverse, uh, these, these frog species because they're important. If you look at the size of them, they're smaller. Um, they eat a lot, uh, some of the uh, different macro invertebrates that are, you know, smaller in size. And so when you remove these animals, a lot of them also eat mosquito larvae, um, you do have an imbalance in our, in our ecology. And so I would like to try to get these guys back. How that is going to happen, I'm still working on it. I don't know if, if creating more green spaces to get and come back into those areas or if relocation of some of those species is the key. But the first thing I wanted to do this year is we are going to survey the metro area to find the presence and absence of these, these three species. Um, and I hear from you know people individually, they see them or they hear them. 
Um, and obviously we've had some citizen science data that shows where they might be. And so this year I'm trying to find out within the watersheds in that 270 belt using a couple different methods. And so traditionally we're gonna use bioacoustic monitoring, um, which is what I'm gonna be using. One of the methods I'm gonna be using at the Litzing Ecology Center is we're going to install some acoustic monitoring methods that can record at nighttime. So if we happen to miss them visually, um, hopefully we'll catch any of them that are calling, even if it's a small population, um, we'll hopefully be able to catch them um, we're also going to do site and field visits um, and with nets um, and come in and, and see if we see any larvae and stuff like that. So we'll do some traditional monitoring. Um, but I'm also reaching out and, and I'm promoting it this year, um, crowdsourcing projects. Um, if you're not familiar, I'm going to go over it near the end. If you've never heard of iNaturalist, there's lots of different ways to collect data. And it's a very easy one using your cell phone or smartphone. Um, and, and I'm interested in all frog calls because it helps me get an idea. I can graph them out and the GPS is stamped. Um, on it so I can know around about what watershed, what area um, you've heard that frog call. And I can usually with different software or usually by ear tell you exactly what species you might've been hearing and where it was. And so we're gonna use some of these methods to get a better idea of where those populations are. And then from there, we might be able to make some decisions of how we might be able to get them to come back into the city. A lot of people always assume, for example, even Forest Park had all these species and they don't. I've been surveying Forest Park since 2004 um, and the only species we have found in, in Forest Park, and not, not that it's a bad, um, but we found bullfrogs, green frogs, leopard frogs, toads, tree frogs, and southern leopard frogs. And those are the only species that we have found. And so these smaller hylidae species no longer exist. So if you look at the watershed, they're all broken up. And these are some of the, the hydraulic units. Um, and you can take a look. And so what I've decided this year, just because of time, and I have an assistant helping me, is we are going to break, if you look at the road system, which usually surrounds some of these different water systems, um, into surveying areas. And so I'll, I'll kind of highlight, I think the next slide, yeah, um, shows what we're going to be looking at this year. So surveying zone one, which is down here, and two, um, we're going to be looking at actual surveying areas inside here uh, for all these three species. And so recording wise and time we're going to be out there will probably end around late April into May because these guys are way done by that time but we're starting now to kind of see what we can find um, and, and it is interesting to find locations and you um, James was um, and Bob were able to say yes we can come into your property because we're trying to find places that we can survey that have access somewhat easy access um, and, and so we can go around and actually survey more places this year we're going to try to survey I think around 12 sites this year. Some of them are parks, some of them are county parks. Um, some of them are places that people have told us they've heard them. Um, and we're still adding stuff to the map. And we're also going to be surveying some stuff on, I don't have it on this map, on the outside. Um, the goal as well as finding these populations long term wise is to find populations that we know exist on the outside of 270 um, for comparison of water quality and habitat quality and also farther out. So we can see if there's a degradation of habitat as you go closer to the city um, and to what parameters these guys can survive in. And so that's the ultimate goal. I know for certain some of these species exist uh, down here where this yellow one is, which is Jefferson Barracks, because somebody sent me a recording last year, I think it was a chorus frog. Um, so we're gonna see what other species still might be in this area. Um, hopefully we're gonna find some down in here and obviously up in the Deer Creek watershed area. So that's what we're gonna be surveying this year. Um, and if you're not familiar with these guys, they're, they're to me, one of my favorite types of, of frogs, actually. I have spent a lot of time looking for tree frogs and cricket frogs. Um, they're fun for me to catch um, and take a look at. They're sometimes hard to identify visually occasionally because the morphology is so different and all, and uh, the variation is, is quite different. Um, but we do have a couple in our area. If you're not familiar with all the ones in our area, we do have gray tree frog and a Cope's uh, gray tree frog. There is a little overlap up in the North County area. I don't believe where you guys are, there's any overlap, but we're gonna be looking into it. If I get recordings, I can tell the difference um, using software. Um, the spring peepers is one you're probably familiar with and the western chorus frog and northern chorus frog. So to give you an idea of what time frame we're looking at, um, these are my targeted species. So the one that the project is named after, and if you wonder why I call it the spring peeper project, my boss thought it would be a better name than like Day project, uh, which I, I agree. Uh, marketing wise, um, spring peepers are probably easier to market than the scientific grouping name, um, but I am interested in all these species. Um, and it is fascinating when you look at these and you go broader. So I am on the backside looking at the Midwest. Um, as you go west and you go north, um, what you're gonna find is some of these species like the cricket frog 
is endangered in Michigan. And so as you, you look on you know, the global, the national scale, there is something happening in the Midwest. There's about a 2.5% decline across the United States in the mid, or I should say in the Midwest of these species alone. And we don't know why, and it, it may just be habitat slowly degrading. Um, there could be many other factors we're unaware of, um, but that's why I wanted to start uh, this project. Uh, the zoo actually was interested in this project because it'd be one of the first ones we've actually started looking at a species before it becomes listed as endangered or threatened um, and start earlier in the process. Since it does have a decline, uh, we wanted to start earlier. Uh, but to give you an idea, um, when I mean early, uh, a lot of these guys, if you think of bringing spring peepers, February, um, and we're already into March. So typically, and it depends on weather, um, these guys typically come out of the end this last week of February, sometimes the, the third week of February, um, and they'll call um, all the way until somewhere in April-ish and they'll, they'll quit calling around then. Whereas if you're looking at cricket frogs, and there is a difference in habitat, um, cricket frogs typically um, are gonna start calling in April and all the way into the summertime. Um, that's typically their strong breeding uh, time. Um, and then chorus frogs, which is the other one, is also early starting in February and uh, somewhere into April. Um, and I'm gonna go back and play these calls and see if you guys have ever heard these. And this is what I'll be looking for. So this is just a few spring peepers calling. Kind of give you an idea. It sounds like a bird typically, which is what I'm looking for. Um, it sounds like jingle bells, the first call that I played earlier when you have a chorus of hundreds of them. I don't even know how long I made this call go for. But we'll see. And then the cricket frog uh, sounds like marbles hitting together. <laughs> Sometimes these drown out when you have a lot of noise because in the background it's sometimes hard for some people to hear it or even pick it up. Now these guys typically like gravel bars and open areas. Um, they do breed, of course, in ponds and stuff like that. Um, spring peepers typically like ponds that sometimes have open sun to them, whereas some of these other species may go more shaded. Um, and it just depends. A lot of these guys are going to lay eggs where water is sitting in the springtime. And, and, and as long as they metamorphosize, and most of them metamorphosize fairly fast, usually within several weeks, um, and you have toadlets coming out of the water, um, and which is pretty fast for most frog species. Same with this guy. And this guy, um, to me, reminds me, I would actually say of a rain stick. I don't know if anybody agrees, but I'll play the call. But it's uh, if you were to do sound-wise or spell it out, some people use the phrase, Pree? It sounds like to me those rain sticks you turn upside down and you hear all the little beads falling down. So those are the species that I'm looking for. Um, and we're going to see if they're on your property, obviously, in the, in the Deer Creek watershed area. But what I've come across so far, and, and this is why I'm also surveying, is I have a lot of people send me recordings and or tell me they still hear those in their area. And so I wanted to find out if that's true. Um, what, what I found so far is, is typically they're hearing tree frogs so far, and that's why I, I want to record, um, or toads and mistake these calls for those animals. And, and here's a great tree frog, which is a little bit later, um, typically in April. Um, and then the, the same with toads come out a little bit later as well. So this is the typical tree frog call, a great tree frog. And there is definitely overlap where you can get a good month in April into May where all of these species can be playing at one or calling, this is a plane, calling at one time. And then the toad is very easy to identify typically. Um, if you were to listen to the toad call, it has a high pitched trill, real soft. Um, and then it, 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 if you listen to it and you look on the graph, you can't see the picture, but there's a little break right here. Because these animals obviously breathe air, he's making a nice long trill by inflating his pouch and he has to take a breath. And so sometimes you can you can actually hear it. I don't know if this recording you can hear it, but let's see. Yep, there you go. So right where he stopped, that's where he's taking a breath. And so sometimes if you're hearing a high-pitched trill, and there's insects that will also make a trill around this frequency, not, not as exact. And that's why if I graph it, I can actually tell. But one of the things I can listen to um, just by listening is I can listen for the break. Whereas if you're an insect, you're going to taper off. Your sound just gets quieter and quieter, and you don't have a distinct stop. 
So one thing, if you're listening, you're not sure if that trill is some type of an insect calling um, or a, a toad, listen for that break. So how can you get involved in this project? And there's a lot of different ways to get involved. Um, and one of them is we're interested in collecting, obviously, information, um, and especially recordings or pictures um, through iNaturalist. And that gives me another data set that does not exist. And I also am the chapter coordinator of Frog Watch. So if anybody's interested um, in getting uh, involved in Frog Watch, the difference is Frog Watch, um, typically you register a site or you'll monitor a site that our chapter is interested in. Um, we do have, I think, uh, um, right now I'm trying to get more chapter sites. I think we have an area that's in um, Forest Park that's safe to pull up um, during the before the curfew ends in Forest Park. And it's usually uh, a half an hour after sunset and you listen for, believe it or not, just three minutes. And But you repeatedly would do the same site. So if you register your own site, um, you're going to listen as often as possible, but maybe once a week. Um, throughout the breeding season and record information about the weather and the site and these frog species you hear. And that helps build the, that data set. And I, I'm using both these data sets to kind of get an idea for my project. Um, but what I wanted to finish talking about a little bit this, um, this morning is about how to use iNaturalist and how to collect frog calls. And the reason why it's a really neat um, citizen science platform that allows me um, the ability to pull any data set that anybody puts on uh, up there, unless they restrict it as private, um, whether it's a photo or a record or audio recording, which is now new. If you have an Android phone, um, um, you can actually on your on your smartphone record it, and it gives the GPS location, and you can help identify it. And I can go in, and other scientists can go in and identify your your um, species that you heard calling or a photo that you've taken. So if you've never heard of iNaturalist, it's something to check out. It's pretty easy. I would always recommend going on the computer to find it first and register yourself an account. You need an email address or now you can also use, if you have already a Google account, you can use those credentials to sign in. It's fairly easy to make an account um, and it's free. Um, so it is, is kind of a fun thing. And once you get an account, it can be a little confusing on the inside. It has typical... Uh, like a social networking setup like like Facebook where you have a lot of different tabs and you can do different things. Um, and there's more than one way to get to the same spot. There's a ribbon up here. You can do pull down menus. And then there's this ribbon across here. Um, you can look at your list. You can actually create your own list of animals. Um, but it, why it's very powerful is that it uses a couple different things. This program uses a computer algorithm to help you identify it. So you don't have to be an expert. You can just take a photo put it up there and the um, computer algorithm will give its best guess um, of what it may be. It'll give you a choices. And it also uses crowdsourcing. So because a lot of people are on this, it's a social networking, people can see your observations and they can review them and they can give their recommendation. If you get enough recommendations out of the same, then your observation becomes a research grade, whereas it's more likely to be correct. Um, it doesn't mean other um, observations are incorrect, but they're um, they're more likely to be correct. So it's a fun thing to explore. There's a lot of other things you can do on here, but typically collecting um, observations and, and, and especially for different projects. And there's a lot of different projects on here, uh, but you'd be clicking add an observation. And, and the question is, what is an observation on iNaturalist? And it's, for the most part, they consider anything that is typically alive, something you saw, and they do include scat and other things on here. Um, for it to be reviewed, um, by somebody else, it has to have a photo to it or an auditory file. So it would have to have one of those. If you don't, it'll still be an observation, but it can't be uh, become a research grade because nobody can see what you saw um, or hear and, and listen to what you saw. Um, and so there are a few rules that they recommend on here, but it's fairly easy. So if you have a smartphone and you took a photo, and this is just a photo that I took, um, it'll show up. This is online, and there's uh, I'll actually show you a screenshot of what it looks like on your telephone. Um, but if you upload a photo, you can also just do it on your desktop. Like if you downloaded these photos from Google Photos or some other thing that you're using, you can upload them and it'll use typically your GPS data that's tagged in your photo when you took it. And it auto fills all these fields on the left for you, which is kind of nice. Um, and then it looks at your photo and the pixels and it'll actually go whoop, and it'll give you a whole list of things that it most likely is similar to and what it could be. Um, and it also typically has like an overall, like it'll say tree frog family. So you can say, all right, I don't know anything more than a tree frog family. So we'll click that, but it will give you some choices. On your telephone, um, if you're, and you're putting on photos, this is typically what comes up when you open up the app, you hit 
ad symbol. And this is for, it's pretty similar for most um, Androids and iPhones, but you'll have some choices. You'll be able to take a photo or you can go choose a photo that's already on your phone that you took, um, or you can choose a sound. The only thing you'd have to remember um, on this is if you, for this app, you'd have to enable the GPS. And so typically when you set up the app, it'll ask, does it have access? Because if the GPS on your phone is not turned on, the tag won't be attached the location wise to the photo. And you'll have to manually go in a little map and drop a pin where you think it is if you don't have it attached. Uh, but it's fairly easy. You can also record and it uses your mic uh, from your telephone. So it's fairly actually pretty accurate. Uh, but once it does that, you put a photo in there, you snap a picture. This is everybody who doesn't recognize. I think it's Dutchman Bridges. Um, at least that's what I call it. Um, but if you take a look, it puts the photo in here. You can add several photos. It only uses the front photo that shows up. But if somebody's reviewing your data, you could have, you know, a couple different angles, picture of the flowers. You can put a bunch of photos in here. Um, obviously, if you take a look, it auto filled itself in for my cell phone, which is nice. And then it gave me the choices. It put in the genus that it believes this uh, plant came from. And if you scroll down, it would give you 10 different choices. And why it's pretty cool is, so that's just using the computer algorithm. You can click on these neat little arrows. And what's neat is you go click, and it now takes all of these guys and you can compare them. So you can zoom in on this picture. You can zoom in this picture. You keep clicking through those awesome information. You can read about each thing. Um, that somebody has created and published so you can compare like a field guide. Um, now, this only typically works if you have Wi-Fi or 4G. So if you're really far out, um, this feature won't work. You can always add observations, but you'll have to wait until you get into um, a place where you have good Wi-Fi or 4G to be able to use these features because this is running um, strictly off the website. Um, but when you pick one and you think you like it, you just hit select um, and you're able to add some of those photos. Um, kind of gives you a little bit of idea. It, it's pretty, I think, if you spend enough time with it, it's pretty easy. Uh, there are some things I recommend, at least do's and don'ts. Um, take test photos. If you put something up there, type in for the name test photo so somebody sees it. There are people that sit online from around the world, by the way. Um, I've done programs where I've done trainings with iNaturalist, and people from around the world will actually live identify uh, the picture I just put up there while I'm teaching a class. So there's, because it's a worldwide program, there's, there's, there's people all the time on there that have an interest and you can filter out observations like new ones. Or if you're a person like me and I like frogs, I can go in and filter out frogs um, observations and sit all day long and help people identify stuff. Um, but typically if you do a test, delete it. So it doesn't sit in there. Um, they recommend um, photographing weeds. Weeds are not bad because it gives us an idea where invasive species might be and other plants. Um, if you do photograph something from your yard that you planted, there is a little place where you can uh, click on there that's cultivated um, or captive. And that gives uh, people an idea of, of that it's not necessarily natural, it's been planted on purpose. Um, and some of the don'ts, uh, they don't want to photograph house plants because um, we, we know what house plants are. Um, and photograph faces, is it breaks a lot of laws, especially when you run the kids. Um, they will typically flag it and remove it um, if they catch it fast enough. Um, so they don't want to photograph uh, faces. Now, it doesn't matter if you have hands or arms in there, um, which is really amazing. I've taken photographs of frogs in my hands, and it some the algorithm knows, I guess, what skin color looks like, or I guess, or the shape. But pixel-wise, it'll pick up on the animal in my hand and not my hand itself. Now, sometimes uh, the algorithms don't work well, which is why you need a human brain. Um, I've actually seen things that it might say it's a frog and it's a rock that looks like a frog because um, it's looking for pixels and shapes and things like that. And, and sometimes the background information is not there. The more photos of an animal that is put in and correctly identified helps the algorithm. Um, at the zoo, I was helping the insectarium on a project where we were photographing American bearing beetles. And the closest it could come to was if you took a photo of American bearing beetle, which is an endangered beetle that we raise at the zoo, it would say it's a beetle, which is not very helpful because we know it's a beetle, but there's lots of beetles. Um, the more uh, photographs we put up of real ones and identified them correctly, the better and better it got to where now it identifies an American bearing beetle versus other types of beetles. Um, and so sometimes it, it doesn't always work depending on um, how many photographs have been uploaded to the software. It gets better and better over time. It's a smart software. Um, and they don't want to upload other people's photos. They need to be your photos because it breaks all kinds of privacy laws, um, copyright laws. And so it needs to be your photo. Um, other than that, uh, it's a lot of fun. Even if you have no interest in frogs and toads, it's a lot of fun. I actually use iNaturalist um, 
to actually identify uh, plants and other things, at least to get me in the right direction. And then I'll go spend more time researching and stuff like that. Um, there's a couple of different resources I was going to put out there right now. I'm working on uh, a new website um, and anybody's welcome to, it's open to the public. Um, and it's made to be a frog resource. Um, and it's, it's uh, right now, I don't know why I'm still working on trying to get it searchable. If you search Google, it won't show up yet. Um, but if you type in www.frogwatchstl.com, it will show up. Um, so right now, somehow I have set something up wrong in the search engine and it does not show up on browsers by just searching for it. You have to type it in correctly. But um, this has a lot of good resources for frogs and toads, um, frog calls that you can practice and review, more information uh, of some natural history and good links to many other sites um, to learn a little bit more about frog calls. Um, anybody's welcome to check it out. It also has some links on here to some of our different projects. Um, the one that I'm calling it now, um, we have two options, which is called Frog Watch Light, which kind of gives training over what's happening to frogs and toads and talks about iNaturalist. And then our traditional Frog Watch training, um, which goes through how to register a site and a little bit more in depth. And, and both of those projects, there's different levels of commitment, and it'll talk about that on this website. Um, and if you also go to the zoo's website, it'll also talk about that on the zoo's website. We have two different spots. And the, all prod, or at least trainings are registered to the zoo's website, um, and that way you get a link sent to you, and they're all virt right now they're virtual trainings. So I'm going to go ahead. I got a little faster than I thought I would be, but I'm going to go ahead and I'll, I'll stop now and see if anybody has any questions um, that were generated maybe about these particular frog species or any questions you have about frogs and toads in our area. Yeah, we got one just, just a second ago here. Uh, where to go? All right. Uh, please talk about the role and importance of frogs and toads, uh, you know, of their ecology of our watersheds. Uh, so I guess you've given us all the reasons why, you know, like what you're doing and all that. I guess it's, they want to know why we should care about the frogs. Sure. Water so why we should care is on the ecology side or the viewpoint of the, at least the species I'm looking at and frogs in general, they play a big deal in the movement of nutrients in and out of waterways. And so if you think of um, the volume of young, or at least larvae that they lay, they typically will eat a massive amount of algae. Um, and as they grow and they metamorphosize, they're gonna start eating small macro invertebrates. And the, the nutrients that they take out of the water, they move onto the terrestrial land. So it moves nutrients in and out. And they also balance it out. Um, if you think of spraying for insects, and obviously there's always insect problems like mosquito issues, but it's been uh, exacerbated by these guys disappearing. Um, if you look at a bullfrog, they do eat mosquito larvae when they're young, but as they get bigger, they don't. They're looking for bigger food sources. So having tiny little tadpoles, and when you're looking at the spring peeper tadpoles, you're talking like this. So the small, these small ones that have disappeared, they're, they're the missing link, if you want to think of that, that is eating mosquito larvae, at least in large quantities. Um, think of it like bats. As you lose the bats, obviously you're in a different species. Some species are fruit bats and some eat a lot more insects and some specialize in smaller insects. We're losing the diversity of our frogs and toads in our area. And so number one, it, it's not a good balance for maintaining, if you want to call it a mosquito control in that aspect or other insects. They're also a massive food source. Um, and so some other species do rely on these particular um, invertebrates, I'm, I'm sorry, vertebrates to eat. Um, at different levels. Some of them eat them as tree frogs. Matter of fact, there's actually salamanders eat a lot of these tadpoles, which I didn't know until I started researching it because I'm in the salamander projects now. Um, a lot of these different larval forms of the cricket frog and spring peeper, they come out the same time the salamanders are out foraging in the spring and the early spring and they eat them as a major food source. So if you think of it in that direction, that was one of the major food sources. So a lot of these guys are starting to lose some of that. So the balance of nutrients um, in the food cycle is definitely a uh, affected by not having these species here. Um, and then if you want to look at the human aspect, it does give us a good example. Um, a lot of them are highly affected by human interactions. And so things that we've done to our environment. So when they start to disappear, it does tell us that something is happening. Either we've destroyed the habitat um, and or there's pollution in our waterways. And so when all frogs disappear, it should be a warning sign that number one, something's happening. A good example would be in Coldwater Creek, it is true back in the 1980s, a Hazelwood High School teacher noticed that a lot of the frog species he couldn't find anymore. When they started looking around, one of the things they noticed um, is there was a lot of dead stuff, but 
but a lot of the ecosystem was degraded. And it wasn't long after that that they figured out that atomic waste had dumped from the airport into Coldwater Creek and spread up all through Hazelwood area. Now, at the same time, where you don't find a lot of frog species, there's also a high amount of cancer rates of bizarre cancers along people who had lived on those areas all along the area. And so correlating wise, it was a great, it's an extreme case, but it's a good example of other species being affected and humans at the same time by the common ingredient, which in that case happened to be radiation um, for, I think it was plutonium. It may not be plutonium. It was uh, some hard metal um, that leaked into those areas. And so if you look at those, there's usually good correlation to pollution and water and, and frogs and toads disappearing and because they're pretty sensitive. Um, some of them are more sensitive than others. So it gives you a warning sign that the little guys disappear. The reason is the pH changes. Uh, they live typically more acidic. And so you add city water and other chemicals and the pH goes on the basic side. Some of the big frogs can handle it. Some of the small ones disappear fast. It also affects the development of eggs. And so it kind of gives us an idea of water chemistry. The next part of my project, after we find out where some of these species are or are not, is we are going to do a massive uh, water testing. Obviously, stream team gives us the data of our streams, but any body of water that is not attached to the stream, there is no data set, at least, you know, like a, a nice large one. And so my goal is to create those for the watersheds to get a better idea of what's happening at all the parks. Um, you know, take Queenie Park or any of those ponds. What's to, if there is something with our waterways? My goal is to see what's going on. Nice. Uh, what would you say is the most versatile frog toad of our area? I mean, I feel like uh, the American toad's pretty, pretty much everywhere. I, I see. And what would give a frog or toad like that that advantage? You know, such a generalist species over these more sensitive ones. Typically, the ones that are more generalized um, and spend more time away from water. Um, so if you think of a toad, obviously they breed in water, but they breed anywhere. Um, but they can typically spend a lot more time not sitting in the water. Um, and that definitely is a, is a big thing. And they typically don't breed in the spring. Um, one of the things I, I've noticed uh, correlation wise, if you're an early spring breeder, um, some of those are, seem a little more sensitive and it may typically it would go up and down. If you don't have a lot of rain this season, then you don't have a lot of options to lay your eggs. Um, but typically toads don't care where they lay their eggs. They lay lots of eggs. Um, they have thicker skin. They go away from water longer. Same with tree frogs. If you were to go to the core of the city, the one frog call that I play that usually if you live deep in the city that everybody hears is the tree frog. And the reason why they're so versatile is they need water to breed, but they live most of their life up in a tree. Um, their skin has a little bit of extra um, secretions on it that kind of keeps them from being desiccated. Um, and they like people because they like buildings because they can climb on them and their, their breeding calls echo. Um, and so they've adapted for people. Same with toads. Um, toads have adapted around people. They do eat all the insects around your homes and things like that. But typically it's because of their skin. Um, they're not sitting in water. Um, and they, whatever reason, they've adapted really well for people. Bullfrogs also are pretty tough. Uh, they're a game species. Um, but because of the trade and the shipping them in and out, these guys have been exposed to all kinds of chemicals and or chytrid funguses and other things that are killing off some of our frog species and have adapted quite well. Um, there's chytrid in all of our water bodies of water from what I've seen, um, and bullfrogs don't seem to be hindered by it at all. And so they're a little bit less sensitive. All right. All right. What if we want to install a pond in our backyard? What would be the ideal size and depth? Cool. Um, typically in our area, uh, the, the best uh, depth that I've seen, probably three, three-ish to four feet deep in, in some area, not the entire thing. Um, typically a shallow area works a little better. For, and it depends what kind of frog species you're trying to attract. Um, bullfrogs uh, will do great uh, in almost any pond surface, but the bullfrogs are a problem because they eat most other frog species. They're territorial. And once you get one, they're going to push most frog species out. Um, if you're trying to attract some of the frog species around us, you want to have a shelf that's typically six inches to a foot deep, um, and I give and, and an area that's barred from fish. If you happen to, if you like fish in a pond, um, that's typically what gets rid of some of these small species. Uh, but that area with a lot of vegetation for hiding um, is what they need to lay their eggs. They don't lay their eggs in deep water, and so they're going to breed in the shallow area, um, and they can swim just fine. But they're going to breed in those shallow areas. Um, and they will actually leave your pond, especially the ones that I've talked about now, and they overwinter or hibernate in the leaf litter. 
So you'd want a place near your pond that there's leaf litter nearby that they can bury down inside. If you get one of the big rana species and rana meaning bullfrog, green frog, leopard frogs, um, a lot of those will overwinter in the mud at the bottom of your pond. And so if you wanted some of those species or you end up with those, if you have a deeper pond, they'll survive better. What happens, I used to install water gardens um, a long time ago in Toledo, Ohio. And what happens typically, if you have your own water garden over years, you know, you build up the debris in the bottom, you don't clean out your pond. As you build up methane gas in the wintertime, um, what'll happen is it'll burn some of those um, amphibians and fish and they swim up and they'll get stuck in the ice and they'll die. Um, so one of the things you'll need is you definitely need something from the berry and like mud at the bottom. If, if you're getting those big bullfrog, green frogs or leopard frogs, um, but you would want to clean out some of that debris so you don't get a massive amount of buildup of methane gases and other things under the ice sheet. Um, or some people put the uh, heater in there just to keep a hole going so gases can exchange coming in and out. Um, but typically most ponds, I don't think you need much deeper than that to keep a population going. Would you say with those species, those bullfrog type species, are they actually going to be able to find your yard if you're in too urbanized of an area? Like the tree frogs and the toads, like I think they'll be able to probably find your pond almost anywhere in St. Louis. But like, would you need to be in some kind of, you know, wildlife corridor, you know, some area with connectivity to get those kind of frogs? My opinion is yes. Um, I don't think if you're really deep inside the area and you're only going to get correct, the animals that are around you, they do migrate, they do move. But with all the road systems we have here and lack of water sites along the way, they're not going to be able to go that far. Now, there's always that chance um, that they're going to find it. Uh, but typically, they are not going to find it, usually within three years, because they move around a lot. Whatever is in a three-year period around your area possibly may show up. Um, but after three to four years, if you've never seen it, there's not, they're not going to show up in your pond without you putting eggs in your pond and you run into issues legally about moving eggs, unless it's from a private property to a private property um, is not illegal, but with MDC rules, you cannot go to, out, to an MDC land or other places like that without permits to move them. Um, and so getting them to move your area, you just have to have them around that area. Yeah. And you can't right now, there's no places that sell them. There are places I think that still sell bullfrogs, but the issue with something like that is, there's too many bullfrogs. And I think that's caused a huge imbalance in some of our areas is you get too many of one species. Um, ephemeral rain gardens, would they attract frogs? Yes, ephemeral rain gardens are an excellent choice to, to put somewhere. Um, and you'll get an idea, obviously, depending on the season, if how much water sits in those areas, you'll get an idea if somebody's going to breed in them, um, but it definitely attracts, especially tree frogs and bull frogs, I'm sorry, tree frogs and toads and things like that. Uh, the big frogs are looking for deep water. Um, the, the ones that I mentioned so far, they're looking for that shallow sitting uh, water. Um, that's what they're going to be breeding in. Um, and sometimes you'll get them. I mean, everybody has a pool in their backyard. It's probably a tree frog lay eggs. Um, I mean, I did um, in Florida. And I, they'll, I'm amazed that they lay eggs in chlorine water, but they do. Um, and around your pool cover, any place that has water when they're breeding, they will typically try to lay eggs during the breeding season. Do we need to join the iNaturalist group or does it automatically filter all frog sightings in the area? It automatically, um, good question. So the way iNaturalist works is when you, if you make an account and you put observations in there, automatically unless you, and you can do it individually, unless you make each observation and there's a pull down menu that says private, all your observations are public. And so when you create a project on there, which is what I've done, um, my project's called, I got a couple of them, but one's called Frog Call STL. It automatically pulls every single uh, observation within the area I designate, which is the metro area. It'll pull them all for my project. Um, so it is nice in that aspect. I don't have to go looking for them. All I have to do is put a filter when I create a project and I can pull all the observations together. Uh, for example, I could very easily make one for um, your property. I could create a geographical boundary of your property and I could pull all observations uh, that, that are in iNaturalist. Um, to give you an idea how powerful it is, I was working with somebody, I think a week ago, talking to somebody from Cuba they're working on a, uh, a Cuban crocodile project and they were trying to find ways for people in Cuba to get interested in, in collecting data like citizen science data 
And while I was talking on the conversation, I thought, well, I wonder what's in iNaturalist. I know it's another country. And the guy said there's not many cell phones in Cuba. Well, I went on the map in iNaturalist and looked up the country Cuba. And there was 52,000 observations of Cuba uh, that were uh, different animals and plants. So obviously somebody in Cuba has access to you know, smartphones and is putting data in, either people visiting or people who live there. Um, so it's not that hard to create projects. If you're brand new to iNaturalist, there is a barrier. You have to actually add enough observations. I don't know what the point is. I can find it for you, but it'll allow you then to make your own project. If you haven't, if you don't have any observations and you haven't been on the, the platform that long, I think it bars you until you get to a certain level of observations. Yeah. Yeah, we have a general biodiversity uh, project here at Litzinger, which just collects all, all data. So plants, animals, uh, you know, fungi, everything. Yeah. Um, so if, if anybody's interested, you can go on iNaturalist, you know, pull up our project and you, you know, you can type in the search, you know, amphibians and it'll pull up, you know, all the amphibians if you want to see uh, just those observations. So their, their search engine is really cool too. So you can just filter through all different types of things. You can just put in a single species of, if you want into the search menu. Um, yeah, those are fantastic questions. Those are good questions. And it is a powerful online tool that I, I recommend. You can make it private. Um, it, like if you have a, here's a good example. Uh, I've been contacted about, which is on the other side of the river, but not far, um, the Illinois chorus frog, which is an endangered species. And the people studying it don't want people to know where it is because if you put it on iNaturalist, everybody's gonna know where to find them and they don't want people looking for them. Um, there is a way to make it private on an naturalist. Um, and so nobody can find the GPS coordinates. There's a couple ways. One, you make everything private and only a few people can join the project, or it allows you to change the GPS to, in an essence, obscure. And so it'll basically show you that, well, somewhere in Illinois <laughs> it is a chorus frogs, but no matter when you zoom in, you can't find exactly the GPS coordinates. The people who put them in can see them, but everybody else cannot. So there are some ways to be able to share data or hide data if you don't want to share it out. There's always lots of good reasons why you'd want to do that. Um, like if you have a backyard and you want to share that certain frog species, but you don't want somebody zooming in on the map and seeing your backyard, all you have to do is there's a couple ways to obscure it. And it, you can do out like bullseye where it's like the county, <laughs> your observations in that area. Um, but there's a couple of different ways you can change that. Let's see here. We got Mary asking oh, what the Blitzinger Rotocology project name is. And Susan just put it into the link. It's the LREC Flora and Fauna Checklist. Cool. Um, and Caroline, it looks like you got your hand up on your iPad. I'm going to ask you to unmute. And I think that should allow you to be able to ask your question. Great. Yes. I'm wondering what did the spring papers and the do in the summer when their ponds dry up? And secondly, um, is there a temperature requirement? I know toads supposedly call when it's over 60 degrees, and I wondered about the peepers. So typically peepers, number one, in the summertime, they're, high, they're hard to find. They're under the leaf litter. Um, so if you were to go, and that's why typically they have wooded areas nearby. If it's just an open field, um, sometimes you can find them. Um, they typically prefer a wooded habitat near a pond. So like a pond on the edge is with a sunny, sunny exposure. Uh, but they're basically under the leaves um, and then you can find them. Um, they're not as easy. They're brown and sometimes they go down just a little deeper um, during the summertime as it gets hotter. Um, but that's where they are. Um, believe it or not, I, I found this out. I thought it was really bizarre, but uh, at the zoo's new property in North County, I was surveying uh, last year up at there to see what kind of you know species are on the zoo's news. Uh, I'm sorry, the zoo's new property. And when I was investigating a pond, I was sitting down and, and I was looking towards the water's edge and there's woods behind it. And I figured, well, that's where all these guys come out of. Well, on my butt, something kept bumping me and I looked down and the peepers were coming out of the ground. And what it was is because it was an old golf course, uh, the road that kind of goes along the sinkhole area, they had buried, I'm pretty sure Chad or rocks, you know, made an embankment and then they put a road on top grass down the side, but there probably were cavities, um, not very deep, but deep enough. And these guys were overwintering down these tiny holes. 
which to me blew my mind because typically you find them in leaf litter and stuff like that. Um, but these were coming, and this was chorus frogs, peepers, and cricket frogs coming out of holes in the ground, um, pretty shallow, but right, in, right around me. So they were look like they're coming out of the grass. Um, the other question is, um, let's see, not in the summertime, oh, temperature wise, um, it has to be typically above freezing, um, but they will call in 40 degree weather. Um, sometimes up, I would say 40, 50, you're gonna start giving a call. And, and the reason why is some of these early uh, breeders actually have, um, I think the chemical, it's a protein that lowers the freezing point in their blood. So they can actually come out and they're active. Now, I, I find it amazing, but I have seen places where there is still a little bit of ice and they are still calling. And it, I, I do find it amazing. Uh, but some of these early breeders and that chorus, uh, I'm sorry, chorus frogs as well, the, these guys that come out in that February and March can come out of really cold temperatures. But what they're looking for is like a day like today where it was kind of cool, obviously it was uh, just above freezing, but it gets up to 55 degrees and it's sunny. This is when they're going to start coming out. But the other, uh, the other aspect we're missing is that rain. When that rain hits, that's the trigger is these warm ups and the rain, warm up in the rain, they, it, it starts to trigger them to wake up um, out of hibernation and you'll start seeing them. So almost like a salamander, that's what they're waiting for too. These rains and the, and the warmer temperatures during the day, cold at night, and they'll start to move out. All right. Great. Looks like we got one more in the chat. Uh, what do frog eggs look like and how long for them to hatch? Um, so frog eggs are all a little bit different than each other, um, but typically most frog eggs, and I think I have, I might be able to share a picture. If you give me a second, I'll have to find it. Um, I've taken lots and lots of photos of, of frog eggs over time. They remind me, um, I hate to use the word grapes because they don't look like grapes, but um, they're, uh, oh, here's a better example. So imagine a clear um, tapioca pearl. You know how we make tapioca from the little beans? Um, they look round like that, but they're clear typically, um, and they're usually in a big mass. Um, sometimes they're not like a great bunch, and they're kind of spread out a little bit. And and um, but that's typically what most of them look like is is little individual circle eggs, um, which makes them different from toad. So toad eggs typically are long and stringy. Um, and give me one second. Keep asking questions. I'm going to see if I can pull some pictures up for you guys. Yeah, I somehow missed one. I had a direct message to me. Uh, okay. Can species be reintroduced to Forest Park? I know you'd mentioned earlier which ones had been seen there, uh, but they're asking if they can be reintroduced. The, the answer is they could. The answer is, can I get permission to do so? Um, I'm not there yet, but um, <laughs> that's something that I, I'm interested in. The, the way I've been looking at it, my original plan was to work with groups to try to get you know green, if you want to call it corridors, to be able to get these frog species that we know where they are back up into that area. I think, unfortunately, in my lifetime, it may never happen. I mean, I may be really old um, by the time to get enough, because if you look at what green corridors exist now, they're good for certain species, but they're not great for spe you know, like spring peepers moving along. They don't have the ephemeral water pools to be able to continue to move. Um, so I'm more interested in the release of maybe some eggs or something like that. The issue comes in, I would have to identify, which is part of my project, is there suitable habitat remaining in Forest Park or can we create any, you know, remaining habitat? Um, if you were to go in Forest Park, you may not know, but the water circulates um, by adding city water to it. And so it's like a water system on top of an old water system. The, the, the river to pair systems up under, actually deep underground. Um, and because of that, the pH um, jumps in many places from seven to nine within a, you know, a 20 foot span because you had city water, you have chlorine. So there are places that are just not suitable, but there are places where the water sits and filters where you may be, you know, be able to withstand. And that is something I'm interested to even see, identify areas in Forest Park and to get permission and see what happens. Can it sustain, you know, population of peepers? I, I think it's possible. Um, and it's something I'm very interested in looking into, but I, I'm not there yet. Right now, I'm trying to identify where the populations are within that metro core area. I know where they are not. They're definitely not in Forest Park, but I'm trying to find areas where they're close by. Um, so hopefully that answered that question. Yeah, and while you're still looking for your egg pictures, because we have one more about eggs, uh, I was just going to mention, I see a couple of people leaving already because we're right about the hour. Sure. Uh, we'll keep on asking Mike a couple questions if he's available, but I wanted to let everybody know uh, that, so the next uh, presentation we had scheduled 
it was in April uh, with Eva Kohlberg. And we actually, so one of our research student partners here on site uh, just got back with me yesterday. Uh, we're actually gonna have another like kind of mini enrichment uh, about her research project on uh, March 30th. So this one's kind of a little bit last minute, uh, but just to let you guys know that there's another uh, little enrichment coming up. It's basically to let her talk about the results of her study. Uh, you might've seen a video on it uh, earlier in, you know, back in 2020 uh, that we had done about uh, a little sweat bee, uh, Rachel Brant and uh, Ezra Kruzich, if you guys recall that, uh, where they were actually looking at um, how these bees are acting differently over the urban gradient. And so, you know, come back for that one. Uh, so that way she can kind of get practice on talking about her research. Uh, so you guys are kind of like the trial run for her talking about it because she's working on her results uh, this month. So the 30th, uh, it'll be a Tuesday at uh, 10 a.m. again, but we'll send out more information on that. And uh, if you guys want to stick around too, uh, if you guys want to have a little chat for, you know, chat with volunteers and staff uh, that can stick around for a little bit, uh, we'll be more than happy to do that too. But uh, back to you, Mike, if you have uh, sure. pictures of those eggs. Okay, can you see this? Yep. So this is toad eggs. So they look more like strings. I know these aren't the greatest pictures, but uh, if you can see it pretty good, that's what little toad eggs look like. These guys will develop into that. Um, let me see, here we go. This is a picture of frog eggs. Kind of give you an idea, see the white in there, the yolk. Um, this is typically what a frog, a patch of frog egg looks like. Now, every species is slightly different, but hopefully that'll kind of give you an idea what it looks like. I can maybe I'll zoom in. I don't know. Yep. There we go. And as, as they metamorphosize, they look a little bit different. They obviously, the, the tadpole starts to expand and the tail starts to form inside. Okay. And the, yeah, the other question about it was, is that they believe that they their ones in their pond look like ribbons. So is that the American toads? That would be American toad. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. If you lay ribbons, I got... I could share a bunch of other pictures, but yeah, if you, 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 the word ribbons would be exactly it. They do look like ribbons or strings. That would be a toad. And then uh, it was a question of, so they like a pH of seven. T typically closer to neutral or on the acidic side for most species. Then there could be an exception, but most of them are on the acidic side. So like 6.5 up to seven. Now I have read that obviously, if you think of some of these other species that sit in these ephemeral ponds, um, though some of those pHs are even lower, like down in five and stuff like that. And the, they can handle those pHs. It's on the other side of seven as you get basic that they seem to have a harder time. So they sounds like to me, they've evolved to be able to be closer to neutral or on the acidic side. Great. Well, that, oh, wait, nope, more popped up, I think. Oh, nope, a bunch of thank yous. There we go. Oh, cool. Thank you. Um, and just in case anyone's curious too about uh, the ephemeral ponds that we have on site here, we used to have three. Uh, I mean, we have a couple like little more ephemeral puddles on site, but now we're down to two because of the MSD project, uh, the path down by the, um, what we used to call the mulch woods, uh, had a little ephemeral pond that uh, we used to see tadpoles in, uh, but that one is no longer in existence. Mm. Um, but we still have the one by the glass house uh, that was actually a constructed pond, but it has a leak in it, so it's more ephemeral now. And then there is still one uh, in the woodland uh, near the cabin. And so Mike's going to be putting up those audio monitors near those two ephemeral ponds. Uh, and we hope in the future uh, to, once the project clear uh, project is passed, we hope to maybe construct in that area, you know, kind of where the old one was, another area where an ephemeral pond could be put in or perhaps just a shallow pond that could, you know, potentially last a little bit longer uh, that we would not put fish in uh, to try and be a more amphibian friendly pond. Um, so more stuff for the future and uh, we're excited to, you know, find, you know, find out what the results of Mike's uh, research here will be and uh, maybe you know, potential for reintroductions here too of species we're missing. That, that'll definitely be a future conversation I'm, I'm interested to get into as we get into next year or so. Awesome. 
Cool. All well, right. thank you everybody for your time. All right. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you. All right. Hey, everybody have a good morning. Thank huh? you. <laughs> Bye.